Hello, welcome to the program. Ahead, Today FM's Kyle suspended over yet another gaffe, while the target of his latest brand, Magda, launches a new show and takes to the catwalk for ACP. New local comedies are hit on subscription, and we'll be talking to the founder of the new audience measurement firm, SMI, also the former editor of the Australian's media section, Jane Schultz. But first, we talk often on the program about what's been the toughest ad market in decades for print media, among other sectors as well. But perhaps in a sign of green shoots, a new magazine title was launched this week. Pacific Magazine's Prevention is a healthy lifestyle monthly targeting women 40 years and over. And to tell us more, we're joined by Natalie Filatov, the editor of Prevention. As well, we've got our co-host James Manning, the editor and publisher of Media Week here. And we also have with us Barry O'Brien, the CEO of media agency PhD. Great to have you all in. Thanks so much for, for coming on the show. Nice Natalie, you, if we could start with you. Great to see a new title launch, Monthly Prevention. <laughs> Just firstly, I mean, any indications yet of how sales are going? I know it's only been a few days. You're right. It's very early days, but at the moment, all indications that we do have are very positive. We're tracking well. Um, no figures as yet. What's the response? You, you've got a bit a better idea what the advertisers thought of it. Um, what, what's been the response like and, and what's the forward bookings? The forward bookings are great and I always tend to, I get very excited about the advertiser response to the magazine because it was more than financial. Um, which was very exciting that they booked in at all in a, in a financial crisis, but um, they really understood the proposition of the magazine and uh, were excited and enthusiastic about the prospect. They felt, as we did, that it was a largely ignored market. Yeah, and, and it's quite interesting because, uh, as you say, you're, you're not targeting a niche, you're, you're looking for that mainstream. Just explain it a bit more about who you're targeting and why. Oh, we're targeting women 40 plus, uh, and as I say, we believe they're uh, largely ignored in the magazine market today. Uh, I think our readers will come from a fairly educated perspective in terms of being interested in health and uh, being interested in researching healthy lifestyle options. Uh, yeah, it's, it is quite broad, uh, but still targeted in the sense of 40 plus. Barry, bring you in here. F women over 40, are they going to steal some readers away from other magazines or could they be growing the market, do you think? That's always a potential where, you know, you could undermine other titles that have been established in the marketplace. Uh, the title looks really good. Uh, you've also got the support of a television network behind it, so would suggest that it's, uh, you know, be very, very successful in terms of the amount of uh, whack that they put behind it, you know, sort of television time and also the online online side. So I think they'll uh, they'll have a success. It, uh, it looks good and it's been well supported so far by some really good uh, advertising brands. So, yeah, I think uh, a lot of good, uh, a lot of good uh, success for them. Yeah. Natalie, who do you see your major, major competitors are? Because there are a lot of healthy lifestyle type magazines out in the market. There are a lot of health magazines, but we're really quite healthy lifestyle. And that said, I'm sure that readers of health magazines will come to prevention and have a look at it. Um, but in the healthy lifestyle area or the broader lifestyle area, I think we um, are probably looking at not necessarily taking readers, but attracting people who read Women's Weekly, Notebook, perhaps. We do see, though, this market as being somewhat disenfranchised, I guess, in terms of magazines. So potentially they'll come mostly from um, newspaper supplement readers, for example. I, and I think we will grow the market. You're following a successful formula for that the magazine sort of the blueprint for, for what they've done in the US. Um, is it always totally celebrity free, what, what they do over there? Do they ever veer into that? Are we likely to see? They have um, quite a strong connection uh, with Biggest Loser, which um, we're not planning on, on following up. Uh, and in that sense, in the celebrity sense, we are celebrity free, unless there's a celebrity who's really inspiring in the 40 plus market in terms of healthy lifestyle. I can see that it might happen, but it's certainly not um, something that we're pursuing. There are enough people chasing the, the celebrity maybe market. Or, maybe almost a plus <coughs> these days, often magazine free of celebrities perhaps. I think so. Yeah. Interesting too, the size of the magazine as mm. well. Uh, why the decision to go with this, this size? We really felt that it was um, particularly reader friendly, um, that this market is looking for a magazine that they can access at any, any time, wherever they are. This size fits easily into your handbag. Um, it does raise a few difficulties in terms of um, distribution and visibility mm. in the news agents, but um, 
We've put a lot of effort into boosting our visibility. And I have to say that even, even um, sometimes when I see it by itself on the stands, it, it pops nicely um, and it, we haven't found it to be um, a disadvantage yet. Barry, what were your thoughts on the format? I don't think there's any disadvantage there at all. I think it's a nice size. Um, I think it's I'll, better though, isn't it, Barry? Uh, big size. <laughs> 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 is that something you've got to get over though? It depend, depends on what day you have to sell that one in. Okay. No, I think, it's, I think it's a good size. Yeah. And the whole handbag thing, not that I carry a handbag, but uh, <laughs> I think it's uh, a great size, uh, particularly for the target group. Well, I guess you're not the target audience, no, obviously. I'm not the target so audience. Just interesting too, because obviously the website and the, mm. the multi platform is, is a big part as mm, well. It is. With, with the website, then. I mean, is there a concern that those women over 40 may not be as website uh, heavy users in as fact, some of those younger? Exactly the opposite. <laughs> um, they're very heavy um, researchers on, on the web, whether for themselves or for their children in some instances. But um, no, I, it's a, a market that's very interested in using the website for research. And our website won't uh, directly copy what's in the magazine. It's more, we're very keen to use the web as a... Um, uh, as a media in its own right. So what we put on the website will be very complimentary to the magazine and we'll use the medium um, for its moving images and things like that rather than and interactive uh, features rather than just to read. Will you hold back? I mean, the, the big argument these days is, mm. oh, does the web cannibalise everything, you know? Uh, Not in our case. Uh, as I say, we won't be putting the whole magazine up right. on the website. Uh, we have additional complementary features on but the, the key, website. the key editorial offerings, you know, weight loss... Um, They're certainly mirrored like on that. the web, and, yeah. but yes, um, it's more uh, additional material on the website rather than putting the magazine up. And just very quickly, Natalie, have you set any sales targets for, for how many copies you want prevention to be selling by oh. a year's time, say? Oh, in a year's time. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm sure uh, we certainly have, but I'm, I'm probably not able to talk about that. I'm reluctant to say. Okay. I'm reluctant to say, yeah. Right. Barry, what about you? What are you recommendations? She said many you millions. You can say it, can you? She said many millions just outside there. <laughs> millions would be nice. <laughs> 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 All right, we'll have to leave it there. But it's been great to have you on the show, thank editor of Prevention, Natalie Filatov. Thank you very much. Okay. Now to a story that's certainly been dominating headlines this week. Today, FM Sydney's Carl Sandilands taken off air for the second time in over a month after saying comedian Magda Zabanski could lose more weight in a concentration camp. Back on July 31st, he and co-host Jackie O were suspended for a radio stunt in which a 14-year-old girl revealed that she'd been raped live on air. Major advertiser Optus has withdrawn advertising from Carl's Breakfast Show as Osterio decides on his future. Just wanted to get your views on this, James and, and Barry. James, firstly, I mean, is Carl's career over? Well, I, I don't think so. I mean, it, it's tempting to think so when you first hear it, but as, as time grows on, you know, a day later, two days later, you think, well, maybe not. That's why Osterio won't rush to any decisions about what they do. Um, maybe they put them on back on air too soon after the other. You know, I think what he's doing now is maybe a reaction to, you know, he's been knocked about a bit about losing the Channel 10 gig, you know, and, um, and all, the, all the media beating he's been taking, I guess. It was a pretty unfortunate thing to say, and it is starting to look like it, it, it could be at a significant crossroad at the very least. Barry, what do you think? I mean, would advertisers be touching Kyle at the moment? It's, uh, it's a great shame because he is a talent and uh, he's the strength of that station because the, the, the breakfast show gives you the, uh, the emphasis for the rest of the, the, rest of the day. Um, I think he's uh, probably got a serious question mark on him, but I hope that uh, they don't unload him. But maybe he needs some time on the sideline to really have a think about uh, you know, what he's doing, what he's saying. Yeah, does he want to keep doing this? And, and if he does, he's... He's going to have to behave, and I guess, as, as they want him to. Perhaps. I think Channel 10 showed very, very quickly in terms of the impact of, uh, of their network. That clearly cost Kyle a lot of money. Uh, then all of a sudden you start to get the, you know, the serious advertisers, the optuses, etc. They start to line up. Then all of a sudden your true value in the market is, uh, is not worth you know, what it was a month ago, two months ago. So I, uh, I would seriously think that he's, uh, he's starting to question, how do I handle myself? And maybe they need to sort of sit and re, you know, revamp and relook at the whole show. And maybe the sort of the, the real sort of whack factor that he's that he's had out there, maybe that needs to be calmed down seriously. And maybe it's not the seven second delay. Maybe it's sort of like the fifteen second delay. Yeah. Okay. And I mean, just finally, I mean, is there any sense that perhaps he doesn't want to be there? That he wants to be in LA? I mean, could he be actually intentionally doing these sorts of gaps? No, I don't, I don't think it'd be intentional. I and mean, I think he'd probably like to be in LA, but I. 
but it, the thing is, he's not at the moment. He doesn't have a career there. He's got his career here, and uh, I think he very much wants to hold on to that. You know, yeah. and there's some survey results out next Tuesday, which I think will have a big impact. For, for what Osterio does, you know, they'll get some sort of read out of that. In the end, it's just going to be a business decision for them. Yeah, but his, replace, his replacements, while he's been off air, doing quite well too. So, obviously, one to watch and mm, see sure. what happens. All right, let's just check on some other news out of the radio sector as well. Of course, this week we saw the launch of Eddie Maguire's new breakfast show on Triple M in Melbourne. James, just quickly, what did you think of that? How, yeah, it was, a, it was a, a great day one. He started very good, you know, Eddie's the ultimate professional, very relaxed cool and collected on air, you know, led his team. It was very much all about Eddie, but that's what the listeners are going to want. If they're going to you know, invest in the station, they don't want to hear all these, all these sidekicks. They want to hear mostly from Eddie, and uh, that's certainly what they got. Um, as I mentioned, uh, whether that translates into ratings yet remains to be seen, because you can have a brilliant show, but it just some, for some reason it misses its mark. So Osterio will need to do a lot of promotion, make sure people understand Eddie's there, and Eddie will be helping in that too. But yeah, it's, it's good signs for Triple M down there. Well, certainly a lot of changes going on, because also Mike Carlton leaving 2UE. Um, Barry, what do you think? I mean, how will um, John Stanley and, and Sandy Aloisi go together in breakfast? That's a pretty tough gig. Uh, it's, it's an area that's been under pressure for quite some time. Carlton clearly is a talent, uh, but you know, they've got a lot of work to do to be able to sort of uh, catch up in terms of 2GB and also you know, the uh, Today FM audience. So there's a lot of work to do there. Uh, but you know, John Stanley has sort of done that slot before, so if, uh, you know, he, he's got enough talent and uh, enough ability to be able to sort of make it work. How do advertisers though, react to all these changes? Is it quite unsettling for them? Well, it's, you know, it means that you have to go back and renegotiate. Um, so I know that uh, Oz Stereo with Kyle uh, had to renegotiate with all the majors uh, because of the impact that, uh, that it uh, had on the show. And likewise, with Carlton coming off, there'll be, uh, there'll be certain advertisers that are very loyal to him. So, yeah, there'll be a lot of sort of discussion going on with current advertisers in terms of what we pay, what we do, and, uh, and where we go forward. We did see some radio ad spend figures out from um, Commercial Radio Australia as well for August during the week. Uh, what, what did you make of those five metro markets there? Uh, two were negative. Yeah, just uh, the trend continues there. I was down 4%, I think, um, year on year, about $50 million they wrote in August. Melbourne market was still, uh, still uh, growing uh, up 2%, so it uh, defies all the odds down there. What are you seeing, I guess, in this sector of the, the media industry? You know, it's been a few weeks since I've been on the show, but uh, it has picked up uh, dramatically over the, you know, over the last six weeks. There's more warmth in the, in the market right across all media. So maybe the last quarter is going to be a lot stronger than, than we all thought. So, yeah, there is, uh, there is activity out there. Is that a prediction or uh, you're hoping that might uh, happen? There's a, there's a large... <laughs> bunch of hope and uh, <laughs> and let's run with that as a prediction. Okay? <laughs> we'll be talking about all of that more after after the break but just finally as well the Beatles proving popular James in September for all the digital radio stations. Yeah they've gone Beatles mad on digital radio. Uh, Australian Radio Network introduced a uh, they of course have the classic hit stream stations in four markets and they've got something called classic hits plus and they've devoted September to the Beatles. At the same time one of the Fairfax radio stations has started uh, a digital stream up in Brisbane 4BH and they're also devoted uh, September to the Beatles. So if you live in Brisbane you're a Beatles fan, you're in like this month. Sure are. Alright, we're just going to step away from the radio sector for a moment and of course talk about the battle continuing for consolidated media and its lucrative stakes in those growth assets, Foxtel and Premier Media with its Fox Sports channels. Now the Seven Network has managed to get two board seats at James Packer's Consolidated Media. It comes as Seven signs an agreement not to buy any more consolidated stock for 12 months. With details of the developments this past week, here's Chris Weston from IG Markets. I don't think anything's going to happen for quite some time now, but you know, asset guidelines stipulate that once you provide a share buyback guidance notice, you have to wait two weeks before you actually uh, you know, take part in that. Now, considering as consolidated media are sitting on about half a million, oh, sorry, half a billion dollars worth of cash or war before the buyback today, you know, you want to try and get access to that cash pool if you are making a takeover. So we are expecting a takeover to happen before uh, the buyback started today. We didn't see that yesterday, so we knew there wasn't going to be a takeover going forward. Um, the fact that they've got two seats on the board, as a shareholder, you would be relatively encouraged. You do want to see your 
your main shareholders getting on? Um, now, Stokes has obviously stipulated that he won't be making any buyouts or, or any buy any further shares for at least 12 months. So that will probably stipulate that we're not going to see too much in the way of corporate activity for there for, for quite some time. They're not going to sell their shares as part of the buyback. Both Stokes and Packer have stipulated that. So we're going to see Stokes take his, his shares, or Seven have their holding uh, taken up to 22.1% and Packer have his holding taken up to 45.4%. Now we expect to see potentially the, the best case scenario here would be a friendly takeover, but that won't be happening for some time. But I think time is on their side at the moment. Telstra is, is obviously having a jewel in the crown. They've got a 50% stake in Foxtel. They won't be forced to divest that unless, they, unless the government stipulate they have to do that as part of the NBN network. Now the key player for me in this whole scenario is News Corp. You know, what are they going to do if they're 25% stake? They're going to act very, very aggressively if they feel this is under pressure. They're sitting on six and a half billion dollars worth of cash. Speculation for the last couple of weeks is that you know what are they going to do? They look to consolidate the pay TV scenario. They could look at a takeover of Ozstar or even Sky Net, uh, New Zealand where they've got a 44% stake. So we could certainly see some consolidation in there and News Corp acting relatively aggressively but I don't think we're going to see anything in the way of corporate activity for at least 12 months given that Stokes has said that. So this may well be forgotten, forgotten very very soon. Stay with us. Coming up on Media Week, we talk to the founder and publisher of the new audience measurement data company, SMI, Jane Schultz. Welcome back. This month has seen the release of the first data from the new audience measurement company SMI. The research found that ad revenues fell 11% in July and August compared to the same time last year, but the August revenue did climb 9% from the previous month. So has the ad market turned a corner? Well, to tell us more about SMI and what the data is showing, we're joined by the founder and publisher Jane Schultz. And also with us, of course, Barry O'Brien, CEO of media agency PhD and our co-host James Manning from Media Week. Uh, great to have you in, Jane. Thank you so much for, for coming on the show. Okay. Just firstly, tell us about the company and, and how you collect the data and, and just why you decided to start it up. Sure. It's actually a world first. Um, what we have done is we have individually contracted each of the major media agencies in Australia, one of which is Barry's Business. And uh, from them, we're getting um, all their booking data. So all the actual financial bookings that they're making on every media across Australia um, comes into our system. Uh, in real time. So once a month we collate it all, um, pull it all together and that means that for the first time in um, only a few days after the end of the month you'll be able to see exactly how much the media agency spent on every media in Australia. And we have to be careful about that because obviously that's not total revenue, like media agency data or media agency revenue is, we would argue, a large, a very, very large part, definitely more than 50% of the market. Um, but there is always going to be the mum and dad, dads who ring up and you know book an ad in Yellow Pages or whatever. We don't collect that. But all the um, ads that are booked by big advertisers, all of which go through the media agents, we collect all that data for the first time. So it really is quite an innovation and a world first and it provides a transparent advertising market for all the players in the media sector for the first time. The agencies who've partnered with you, they can obviously use this to, you know, it gives them a lot of insight into what's happening. But yeah, I guess you don't make any money out of them. Who's your pitch to and who are your customers you're looking to sign? Well, obviously the media um, will find this incredibly valuable um, because for the first time every month they'll be able to see exactly what's happening in all the rival media. So today what happens is that the TV networks kind of compete amongst themselves, the radio networks compete amongst themselves. Um, but now, if they, um, have, if they want to, they can actually try and find revenue from each other. You know, they, they've got the full data set for the first time. So it opens up a whole new world of opportunity for them. And, you know, they can be clever and think laterally. Also, it um, provides far more opportunity for cross-platform media deals because everyone's working with the same trading currency for the first time. So it really is a very big and exciting change for the industry. Tell us about what you saw from the first data that was released. The most interesting thing is that the media agency, um, the size of the media agency revenue is about six and a half billion dollars we found last year. Um, so it really opens up some interesting questions about how much 
is the size of the advertising market in Australia. Historically, we've always thought it was 13 billion. Um, that may be the case, but the fact of the matter is we can now prove categorically for the first time that um, the medium and large advertisers, who we think are um, the most stable and influential of the um, part of the market, are um, spending six and a half billion dollars a year. So we can see um, authoritative figures around that and within that we can see the different splits. So how much do the media agencies spend on television, how much on radio, for example, how much on newspapers. Now that varies by media. Um, you know, newspapers, for example, have historically had a large base of classified advertising revenues with people you know, booking their personal ads, for example. Um, now, uh, though, we can see exactly how much the media agencies are spending on newspapers and it's more stable than um, many people have expected. You would have loved all this stuff when you were still uh, writing it for the Australian, <laughs> I bet. But if I can ask you, Barry, the, what, does it let you go back to your clients and say, look, we've got an even you know, better look at what's happening out there and can fine-tune campaigns and stuff? To... I, as, far as, the, uh, as far as the data, um, there's not a media uh, CEO or executive at the moment who's not saying, this is fantastic. You know, it really is. It, it, it's absolute gold because what it enables us to do is to be able to track year on year, month on month, see who's up, see who's down, see who's hurting, see who's not, see where the opportunities are, as Jonas just said. So I just think that um, as, it, as it develops, and, the, and uh, clearly the tool will develop in terms of the, the more applications that will come out of it, but the early stages are that it's very, very exciting and it's, and it's great information for us, but also, most importantly, for the clients for the customer, the people that actually pay for the, you know, pay the money to uh, put the ads on air and uh, in the newspaper. So I think it's, uh, I think it's a solid base and uh, we're very excited about it. Mm -hmm. Are there any concerns, Jane, I guess, about, I mean, gremlins having to, to be sort of ironed out of the system? Because there was a report uh, from, from a, an uh, unnamed media executive in the Australian media section, <laughs> you're, you, which you, of course, used to be the editor of. I mean, is that, is that something that, that will just take a, a little time for the data to be worked out of? Well, look, it was a massive job. Um, we outsourced the harmonisation of the data to BCC, who um, is an incredible company. Um, they provide the trading software for all the media agencies. So they take all the booking codes in and it turns out there's 33,000 individual media in Australia that you can buy an ad in. <laughs> it's incredible really. You know, people talk about diversity of Australian media. Um, there is an incredibly diverse Australian media market out there. Um, so in all of that, um, there was a huge amount of work. And I suppose when you're um, harmonising 33,000 uh, booking codes, or sorry, if there's more than each agency's booking code on 33,000 media, you know, you'll get it right most of the time, but you know, there might be the occasional thing. But in terms of that particular issue with the gremlins, all that, well, there were no gremlins. <laughs> All that was is that some media agencies book things slightly differently and over time we'll evolve that so that um, everyone will book things um, the same way. In that example what it was is that MySpace is booked by some agencies as MySpace. Um, MySpace is part of the Fox Interactive uh, media network of which there are four or five different websites. Um, some media agencies just book it as Fox Interactive. So over time we will educate everyone to just um, book it as MySpace and so that will be fine. Um, and even so, it's perfectly obvious now exactly how much has gone to Fox Interactive Media because you can see both the Fox Interactive booking code and the MySpace booking code. So they're, they're both there. Um, it's just how you want to look at it. Mm, we should quiz Barry on how many of those 33,000 he's on top of. <laughs> I think I did all of them. Yeah. <laughs> of the, uh, yeah, you had some fascinating commentary, even though you only really got yeah. one month of, of year on year figures. Uh, some of your comments about, about newspapers, how well they're really doing here, especially yeah. compared to the rest of the world, yeah. and um, something you said about outdoor too. So. Yeah, I think what is incredible about this data, specifically um, regarding newspapers, is that A, the decline in newspaper revenues is not anywhere near what they're talking about overseas. Like the Australian newspaper market is incredibly stable. Um, our newspaper companies um, are very economic, you know, they've got strong revenue bases, they keep their costs in line, they're good businesses. Um, on top of that, we show that 
that's their top line revenue, so their normal display revenue. But then within the magazine data that we've got as well, uh, newspaper magazine inserts, so you know, The Age magazine, The Weekend Australian magazine, actually make up a very large part of that. So that's another part of the newspaper company's revenues that hasn't really been accounted for properly in the past. And then in the dis uh, online display sector, they are very big there as well, News and Fairfax. So if you add it all up, they're actually um, a greater part of the uh, overall market than people have really thought of in the past. All right, so much yeah. more that we would love to have asked you about, but we'll have to leave it there, I'm afraid. Jane Schultz, founder and publisher of SMY, thank you so much. And of course, Barry O'Brien, CEO of PhD, great to have you on again. Thank you. Time for a very quick check on the results of week 36 of the rating season. Free to air, top 10 first. Pack to the rafters in top spot again. Tens talking about your generation, the finale, of course, uh, a big winner for 10 there. James uh, in third spot. And of course, Midsummer Murders. Yeah, yet again. the interesting one there, Midsummer Murders on the ABC, sucking up a lot of viewers from the commercial networks on a Sunday night. Luckily for the commercial networks, they don't make many of Midsummer Murders, so it won't be around for too long. And just quickly as well, turning the page there, the Dancing with the Stars finale, sixth most watched, nine new Sunday returning to the top ten. And that ten in itself, that's too. been sucking up a lot of the audience of Australian Idol. One of the reasons Idol hasn't been going so well this year, and the two shows have uh, never gone head to head previously. So Idol will be hoping for a lift this week. Now it's all over. Just quickly, of course, as well, we did see a few debuts this week, but one of them was the this been an experiment. Magda, the host there, she's also going to be taking to the catwalk for Women's Day. So uh, quite a busy woman. A busy week for her. Yeah, interesting. A lot of people were surprised by. How, how much uh, the Spearman experiment looks like 20 to 1 in the words of some people it's exactly the same so yeah, it didn't do that well on debut so it'd be interesting to see how it stacks up again next week. Alright and just let's turn now to what we saw for the subscription TV ratings for week 36 we are looking at the top 10 non-sport shows here. Uh, TV1 yeah, yeah. yeah TV1, TV1 one at well. NCIS doing very well and we've talked about before a new NCIS spin-off coming soon to 10 which, uh, which should help them and just turning the page, Arena's Project Runway Australia there um, in uh, sixth space. Uh, how's it faring? Obviously nearing the, the finals there. Uh, yeah, it actually finished uh, last night, I think it was, so that'll crop up on next week's uh, chart. We'll have a look then. Yeah. All right, and just a, a couple of other things to ask you as well about uh, the launch of the Jesters in 30 seconds. Uh, what, what did you, you think of those on the... The, uh, yeah, yet to watch the gestures. I saw 30 seconds. It was great. Um, it was the uh, second highest uh, debut ever, I think, on the Comedy Channel after the American Rosso show. So it did quite well for them. All right then, yeah. okay, and then we're just looking at the jesters as well, the other debut. Uh, as well, we've got Jay Leno coming to the Comedy Channel too, just sticking with the, the comedy theme. This is a big win for that channel. It is, yeah. He's, um, he's going into prime time. He used to be on 11.30, of course, in the US. He's been brought forward to 10pm, 10, 10 five nights a week with a new series. Uh, quite revolutionary, really, for, for what they say that in the press releases, and you go, oh, yeah. But it is a big deal putting a talk show, stripping it into prime time like that. So it's 7.30 here on the Comedy Channel every night. Uh, of course, repeated. You can watch it on there plus two if that's too early for you. Mm -hmm. All right, we've got to leave it there. James Manning, editor of Thank Media you. Week. Thank you as always. And that is the show for this week from the team here. Thanks for your company.